It's interesting. Um, changing gears just a little, pardon me, just changing gears just a little bit here. I mean, as you're, I'm sure you're aware, uh, the Euro Central Bank uh, actually marks to market its assets and liabilities every quarter. Unlike the United States that keeps its gold at forty-two dollars an ounce, the Euro actually winds up marking its gold I think it's to market forty-four point forty-four. Pardon me, sorry. Yeah. Um, and if you look at the, at the formation of the euro, their reserves were roughly 70% foreign currency reserves and 30% bullion reserves. And because of the price appreciation of, of gold and yeah. the dilution of paper currencies, that's actually flip-flopped. And now it's 70-30 the other way. Um, I was just curious, do you think, can gold save the euro? Uh, well, any uh, central bank that has uh, gold as part of their reserves, uh, if gold rises enough to uh, match the value of all the currency that that central bank has produced, which is a reflection of total credit, then yes, but it takes some extraordinary uh, figures. Uh, you know, when I was writing my book, uh, my book was six, over six years of research and two and a half years of writing and editing. And um, uh, I tried to calculate uh, the, what the price of gold would have to be to go back onto a Bretton Woods type of system where the U.S. dollar is convertible to gold to foreign central banks only. And it was very simple. You find out how much, uh, how many dollars foreign central banks are holding, and you divide that by the, the number of ounces of gold at the Treasury. And uh, I came up with $20,000 ounce, an ounce gold back then. Wow. And that was just to, that, that's to only cover the dollars that are in foreign central banks. And so you're cheating gold as much as possible. They're going to, you know, I believe that there's going to be a new currency, a new currency system in this decade. Every 30 to 40 years, the world has a new monetary system. Uh, most people don't realize this. Uh, it doesn't. The the previous transitions did not affect the common man. It was only central banks and, and large international banks that were panicked uh, when we transfer, when we change from one system to another. Uh, but. I believe that uh, uh, gold will reassert itself as money, and, and yes, it could save the euro by rising until all euros are convertible into gold. Well, for all dollars to be convertible into gold, if you take total credit divided by the number of ounces of the treasury, you come up with $203,000 ounce wow. gold. That's how many <laughs> units of currency we have printed, wow. and those units of currency used to represent gold. Right, back, you know, before World War II, any before 1934, anybody could walk into the bank and convert their dollars back into gold. Gold was the money. The uh, paper things, the the dollars, were the currency that represented gold. It's not money in and of itself. Right. So, wow. Um, and so, how I mean, how close are we in the U.S. to a tipping point? I think a lot of people in the gold community are, you know, we see we just. Past 100 percent of GDP in terms of debt, and it, it seems like there's a confluence of factors from state debt, local debt, personal debt coming together. I mean, how close are we? Do you think it's going to happen this decade? Um, well, you know, we're we're at a point where it should be uh, happening now. Except there are other economies that are in worse shape than we are. You know, you're seeing this in Europe, and through a, a series of, of very fortunate events uh, for the the last century. Uh, the, the dollar became the reserve currency of the world, and uh, it was very stable and very trusted, and, and largely because we didn't have the major wars on our soil. World War I and World War II did not happen here. Uh, and um, uh, I'm sorry, I lost track. What was the question again? Oh, I was talking about <laughs> just how close we are to the tipping point. How close are we are already to the tipping point? Um, I think if you didn't have people uh, sometimes fleeing other currencies. We've seen, uh, it, we've seen problems with the euro, we've seen problems with Greece, and it sends people over to the U.S. Uh, to buy U.S. treasuries and such, safe haven assets. They still consider the U.S. treasury a safe haven asset. Well, uh, like you just uh, were pointing out, it's not the safe haven anymore. We are at what would historically be a, a tipping point. And I believe that we're going to see some short-term deflation still. Uh, I believe the tipping point, though, does come in this decade. The dollar standard is now 40 years old. Every 30 to 40 years, the world has a new monetary system. This one is uh, uh, the 
longest lived at this point, but you can see the stress cracks developing. All man-made systems uh, eventually fail because you've got a small group of men, the FOMC committee, trying to decide how much currency is going to be in the system and trying to uh, decide the price of, of currency, interest rates. And uh, they, can't, they have the audacity and the arrogance to think that they know more than the, than the free market knows. The free market is the sum total of all the transactions that go on in a society. And uh, when they do these things and manipulate the economy, pressure builds up. They, they skew the economy. Pressure builds up in certain areas, and eventually stress cracks uh, develop, and the whole thing implodes. And that is why the uh, the gold exchange standard between World War One and World War Two imploded. It's why the Bretton Woods system imploded. is is because of these misallocations of capital and pressures building up. And now the dollar standard is about to implode. Also, um, the free market is a self-adjusting mechanism. They were, they were to allow, and people don't understand that we actually don't have free markets in the United States. 50% of every transaction is the currency involved. And so if that currency is being manipulated by a small group of men making a decision of what the cost of the currency is and how much of it is going to be in the system, that means it's not a free market. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a manipulated market. And all manipulation has come to an end one day. Uh, in this decade, uh, we're going to see uh, some huge shift. And the great thing is, you know, it's going to be bad for most people, but the great thing is that this causes a wealth transfer. And the wealth is not destroyed, it is just transferred from uh, one set of hands to another. And uh, like I've been saying, this is the greatest wealth transfer in history, therefore it's the greatest opportunity in history. Wow. But changing gears just one more time, I mean, at GBI we obviously focus on the physical asset. Uh, and there's a lot of controversy in the gold community about accessing uh, accessing exposure through the paper markets or actually buying the physical asset themselves. Yeah. And the MF Global issue has only brought that to the forefront. You have people with warehouse receipts for a silver bar and a gold bar, and they actually can't go in and they're not going to get 100% of their assets. So I just wanted to get a sense of what yeah. you thought, how that would affect the paper markets, and, are the, and frankly, are the paper markets viable in the long term? Uh, no. We're in that cycle from uh, paper assets to tangible assets. Uh, and I think you're going to see a lot of the paper assets sort of evaporate because uh, they're not real. Uh, Jeff Christian, uh, head of this, head of CPM Group, which is uh, one of the companies that audits the precious metals sector every year and comes out with a report, and it's a very detailed audit. And they've been doing this since the uh, 70s, and uh, so he is one of the big authorities on it. And he recently stated that the gold markets are leveraged to about 100 to 1. So there's a hundred people out there thinking that they can lay claim to the same amounts of gold. We just saw MF Global uh, implode, and people are not getting all the gold that they own. And they actually had warehouse receipts with bar numbers on them, and Scary. they're not getting those bars. They thought they owned them. They didn't. Uh, when you go with segregated storage in a, in a third-party depository, uh, it's, it's segregated, it's separated from everybody else's metal. Uh, you've got a bar list, and it's basically your account with your gold. Uh, it doesn't belong to anybody else. Nobody else can short that uh, gold. When, when you do a short sell, uh, while it's out there sold, two people own that same uh, product. Somebody uh, owns a stock or, or uh, an ETF or whatever, and the brokerage house will uh, loan some of those shares to somebody else to sell into the market. Now two people own those ounces. The person that's short has to buy back one day. But the very fact that there's more owners out there than there are ounces to cover the owners is fraudulent. And all of this uh, is, there, there's going to be a big train wreck one day. And it is like a, a set of, if you've got the market's leveraged at 100 to 1, you're playing a game of musical chairs. And there's a hundred chairs out there, and a hundred people dancing around the room. And you take 99 of those chairs away, and then the music stops, and everybody scrambles for that one chair. But there's already somebody sitting in it, and he's the guy that actually owns his ounce of gold. Right. I like to say, if you can't hold it, you don't own it. Right. Uh, if it's not real and sitting in a vault, so either in your own ownership or 
uh, sitting in a vault somewhere where you have title to it and it's not uh, some account where uh, it's uh, uh, where other people ha have access to it. When you're talking about segregated vault storage, then you actually own it. You're the guy sitting in the chair. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Well, Mr. Maloney, goldsilver.com, thank you for taking the time. It's been a privilege to have you in the office today. We're really excited to have you. Thank you for giving us your time. Thank today. you. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thank you.